So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or on my website at www.josiesartschool.com. I'd like to start with some words from The Happiness of Pursuit by Chris Gillibo. John Francis was an environmentalist before he knew what the word meant. An African-American man who grew up in Philadelphia before migrating west to California, John had been sensitive to the world of nature for as long as he could remember. In 1971, two oil tankers collided in the San Francisco Bay, spilling half a million gallons of crude oil into the waters near the Golden Great Bridge. John was angry and saddened by the oil spill, but he also felt frustrated. What can one person do? The idea came to him in much the same way I thought about visiting every other country. It was a notion that seemed crazy at first, but wouldn't go away. Still disturbed by the oil spill a year later, John was hanging out with his friend, Jean, one night when he blurted out his idea. We could stop driving cars. Stop riding in them, too, he said. Jean agreed, but then reality kicked in. That would be a good thing to do when we have more money. Yeah, it's probably not realistic. But the idea stayed with him, and like many other crazy ideas, there was something in it. A few weeks later, John was headed to a party at a nightclub in a neighboring town 20 miles away and he decided to walk instead of drive. Leaving the car keys behind and putting a day pack on his back, he hit the road and started off toward the party. As you might expect, it takes a long time to walk 20 miles. Turning down offers for rides, John finally stopped at a fast food restaurant around midnight, where the teenager at the counter refused to take his money after learning how far he'd walked. By the time he'd made it to the nightclub, it was 1 a.m., and the band was winding down with their final encore. No matter, he'd made it. The next day, John checked into a motel, took a hot shower, and spent the afternoon recharging by the pool before heading out to walk the 20 miles back home. It was physically harder than the first walk since his muscles weren't used to such effort. But mentally, he began adjusting to the idea of slow-distance travel. It's not every day that someone decides to walk 40 miles round trip to a nightclub. So his friends had arranged a welcoming celebration in light of the achievement. Champagne was served and the group asked John to explain more about his crazy expedition. That's when John said something that surprised even him. It was a taste of freedom. For a while, I hoped I didn't have to come back. The taste of freedom was enticing. I have taken the first step on a journey that will shape my life, he wrote in a journal that later became his memoir. I cannot stop now. After the experience of walking 40 miles to the dance party, John had difficulty readjusting to normal life. One day he decided to walk indefinitely. Wherever he needed to go, whatever he needed to do, he'd find a way to get there on foot. Learning to walk everywhere was surprisingly easy, but adjusting to life without cars took some time. John's job as a concert promoter didn't last. His friendships changed since he was no longer able to make last-minute plans. When his friends went to a movie at a theater that was 25 miles away, 
John had to plan a day in advance to walk to meet them. Some people found his decision to avoid cars inspiring, but others were confused and even hurt. Drivers would stop to offer him rides. John would decline and explain about his protest of the oil spill, and the drivers would be offended. Do you think you're better than me, some asked. John shared his impressions of the early experience in his journal. I have taken a stand that challenges a way of life, he wrote. It is no wonder that people challenge me. I am challenging myself. Yet the greatest frustration wasn't the people who didn't get it. It was that he didn't know how to explain what he was doing. I am unable to articulate behind a sing- beyond a single phrase about why I walk. I start to feel that each step taken is a part of an invisible journey for which there is no map and few road signs. I am not sure I'm prepared. As John was processing his new way of life, his mother said something offhand that reframed the whole idea. On a phone call placed to her home in Philadelphia, he told her about how happy he was to walk everywhere. But something in his voice sounded off, and his perceptive mother picked up on it. You know, Johnny, he said, when a person is really happy, they don't have to tell people about it. It just shows. Unbeknown to her at the time, this conversation inspired a, no, a whole new phrase, phase in John's pursuit of purpose. On John's 27th birthday, he decided to remain silent for a day. A gift, as he put it, to everyone who'd been listening to him chatter and argue about the new phase of life he was in. He walked out to the beach five hours away. He spent the day journaling and painting, falling asleep on the sand and staying until the next day, and then the next. Three days later, he finally headed home, but something had changed. Several more weeks went by, all without John saying a word. Now he knew what his real challenge was. Not only would he forgo riding in cars, but he'd also live his life in total silence. Not everyone understood John's new silence, and just like when he started walking everywhere, some people were angry. But since he wasn't able to respond, at least not in the usual manner, he found his form of protest different from when he was not just riding in cars. John was just trying to adopt an unconventional lifestyle rooted in his beliefs about the environment. Not speaking precludes argument, he wrote in his journal, and the silence instructs me to listen. These words are from the book The Crossroads of Should and Must by L. Luna. Another manifestation of what I was going through appeared when I was reading Arianna Huffington's biography of Pablo Picasso. In it, she describes how Picasso balanced life and work, saying, The more I discovered about his life, and the more I delved into his art, the more the two converged. It's not what an artist does that counts, but what he is, Picasso said. But his art was so thoroughly autobiographical that what he did was what he was. Yes, Picasso had an incredible talent. But the secret to his genius was this. Picasso's life blended seamlessly with his work. What he did was what he was. What he did was what he was. What he did was what he was. I could not stop reading that sentence. It felt like the key that unlocked a thousand doors. It was impossible to tell where his life ended and his paintings began. It was one, all one huge swirling mix of bullfights and beaches and brushes. This led me to a hypothesis. What if our job equals our career equals our calling? What if who we are and what we do become one and the same? 
What if our work is so thoroughly autobiographical that we can't parse the product from the person? In this place, job descriptions and titles no longer make sense. We no longer go to work. We are the work. From my book, Deepen the Way You Live Your Life. Choose to color your life with adventure. Maya Angelou says, Life is pure adventure, and the sooner we realize that, the quicker we will be able to treat life as art. Think about the times in your life when you felt pure joy. When you woke up in the morning, how did you feel? Did you notice how you dressed? Did you sing more? What was your outlook on your circumstances? Is your life a piece of art? What parts of your life can you still fill with more color? More substance.